We all strive to live a long, prosperous, and healthy life. With advances in health and medical sciences, this goal is ever more attainable. The Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging is a nonprofit organized research unit under the auspices of the University of California at San Diego, committed to advancing lifelong health and independence through research, education, and patient care. To better empower and improve the lives of young and old alike, the Stein Institute presents the following program. Good evening. Uh, welcome, and thank you for the opportunity to spend uh, the next hour or so with you talking about a topic that's very dear to me, which is what are the challenges and goals of palliative care, and, and what is palliative care, and how does it apply to our setting? So a as I talk over the next period of time, I'm going to focus on illness in the past and present, and try to give you a context for what is palliative care, talk a little bit about conceptions of suffering, some elements of the modern illness experience. I will define palliative care and talk a little bit about the goals. And I'm going to integrate a case story throughout so you get a sense of how this might play out. But here we are talking about our future. That's the reality. Every single person in this room will have an advanced life-threatening illness, and you will all, as will I, one day die. It's not optional. It's not like heart disease, where you might get it or you might not get it. It's not like cancer, you might or you might not. Everybody is going to have an advanced illness and die. So we're actually talking about our own personal futures. As I get into that, I'd like to ask a question of the folks in the audience and anybody who's watching to contemplate for yourself, and I'm interested in hearing from you, what adds most to the meaning, the value, and the quality of your life? What would you say? Health. Health. Friends and family. Friends and family. Children. Children. Activity. Activity. Work. Work. So being able to do things, right? A loving relationship. A loving relationship. A partner. A partner. You're a very serious group. Does anybody like to have any fun? <laughs> What do you do for fun that adds value for you? Shopping. Shopping. I'm with you. Retail therapy is terrific, isn't it? <laughs> I love it. What else adds fun to your life that you'd say is valuable? Parties. Parties. Entertainment. Entertainment. Good food. Good food. Absolutely. I totally agree about that. So. Each one of you has a very different and very personal perspective, don't you? If you were to turn to the person beside you without asking them what adds meaning and value, could you tell me what's important to them if you didn't ask? No. We need to ask, don't we? Because it is so personal and it's so different from one person to the other. So now I'd like you to imagine along with me. It's been six or eight weeks. You've noticed that you've not been feeling well. You've been losing some weight. You've been getting more fatigue. You've noticed in the last three or four weeks the onset of some weakness as well as some pain. Like most folks, you said, hmm, I'll get over this. I didn't go to the doctor right away. But finally, a couple of weeks ago, you went to the doctor. You had some tests, and you learned that you have an advanced life-threatening illness. And the reality, after you've had a chance to think about this, is you really do only have a few weeks left to live. This is not a situation where the data is wrong. You've heard that. Your family's heard it. Now, 
given the fact that you will only live a few more weeks, what will add most to your sense of meaning and value? I'm listening. Family. Family. Friends. Friends. Being physically comfortable. Being physically comfortable. Take care of your affairs, your financial affairs, so your, your heirs are, don't have any problems. So take care of your financial affairs and your affairs so that your heirs or the people who survive you don't have any problems. So get your business in order, as it were, yes? Yes. I would want to see nature. I would want to be able to see the outdoors or have views of trees and outdoors. Right, so to be able to experience the outdoors, trees, other aspects of nature. Right. So you really want some other types of stimulus is what I hear, yes? yes. Be out in the world. Not, you don't want to be stuck in a bed in a room? Right. right. What else would you hope for? Again, you're very serious. Does anybody want to have some fun? Making sense of me and the value of my disorder, my medical situation. Making sense of your medical situation, the disorder that's happening, the illness that's happening to you. Sure. It's a big question for so many people, isn't it? Why me? Why is this happening? What am I supposed to do with this? Why now? Sure. Well, again, each one of you has a very personal perspective, don't you? If we look historically at what's happened, there's been a huge shift in the illness experience. If we go back to the time prior to antibiotics, so we get penicillin basically in the 30s and introduce it widely in the 40s, but if we think before that, how did people live their lives and how did they experience the end of their lives? Prior to antibiotics, so now we're talking 1800s, early 1900s, people lived their lives along, and if you think of the bottom axis as time evolving, people lived their lives and then died pretty suddenly over hours to days, most people. Death was typically sudden, unexpected. Infections were the major cause of death, as were accidents. If you survived uh, infancy, you could expect to live into your 60s. In fact, as we look at the types of infections, up to 30% of death was related to dental problems. So we've really made a change, but death was sudden. In the United States, in fact, doctors primarily provided palliative care and had pretty ready access to morphine, and they actually used it. Then we see, so if I think about the 30s, early 40s as the point where we introduce penicillin and start to get other medications and start to change medicine, the beginning of the modern medicine revolution, then from the 40s to the 1980s, we start to see a significant shift. People now start to live with an underlying illness and we start to be able to see patients living in the face of decline, they don't die suddenly, and we can start to see that they're dying over time. They're declining. They have multiple issues that now are confronting them. Death and the dying process becomes more predictable. This change from people died quickly over hours to days to now we start to see people experiencing illness over time with multiple issues causing suffering led to the modern hospice movement the beginning of which was really in the 1960s and is credited to Dame Cecily Saunders. And if you think about the focus of care, so I'm going to use this diagram a couple of times. Again, if we start over on the left and the bottom is time, so the person is living their life and comes along to the point where they have symptoms like I just described in our imaginary scenario and they present to the healthcare system and then they live with their illness until they die over here on the right, What's the focus of care? Initially, it was very appropriate for modern medicine, which didn't have antibiotics, didn't have surgical techniques, to focus on trying to treat the disease. And the whole thrust of the first part of the modern medicine revolution was managing disease. But then we start to see patients who are declining. And there's a time when it will be appropriate for them to have end-of-life care. 
we start to see patients in need of bereavement. So these are the family members who survive the patient after the death. They have a loss experience and we begin to realize that it would be appropriate for them to have bereavement services. And all of this we call hospice. And as early as 1982 in the United States, Medicare recognized the importance as the rest of the healthcare system was winding down of providing a special benefit that we call today the Medicare Hospice Benefit to care for patients as they approach the end of their lives. It was a revolution in thinking. It's the first, and I'm still going to suggest, the best model for caring for patients at the end of their lives. And Medicare from the beginning recognized because of the multiple issues facing these patients, they should provide nursing services, social supports, spiritual supports, as well as medications, equipment, and supplies, and focus on trying to keep patients at home. Still, it's the best benefit in the world. And that was really end-of-life care and hospice being a wonderful way to provide that care. Now, many hospice programs grew up. This is one in England a lovely house on the hill. And they started to get the stories of how people were dying in hospices of grandmother lying in bed, arms crossed, peaceful, comfortable, surrounded by her children, lovely music playing, slipping quietly away. Is this the way people die in America today? In fact, not. And in fact, if we're going to do care of patients at the end of life in specialized buildings like this, we're actually not going to be able to care for many people, are we? Now, it does turn out at San Diego Hospice, we actually have a house on the hill as well with 24 beds, but it's only for 24 patients, and they need to be patients who are really pretty sick, and in fact, they can only stay for a few days. So these aren't really long-stay facilities. Here's Dame Cecily Saunders, the wonderful person who had the idea of developing hospice movement, starting with St. Christopher's in London, uh, and really begat the movement which moved across the world. The first hospice coming to the United States in 1977, 1974, I'm sorry, and then Dr. Doris Howell, who's here with us this evening, starting San Diego Hospice here in San Diego County in 1977. So a real evolution that took place quickly in America. And today we have over four and a half thousand hospice corporations across the United States. But what's it like in 2008 and 2009? Clearly medicine has advanced significantly as well as public health has advanced. We have better sanitation, we have better water supplies, we have sophisticated medications, technology. We can really change people's experience. And if we look at what is disease and aging like now, 2008, 2009, the reality is we sometimes cure patients, but in fact, not all that often. If you think about, of the cancers, what do you cure? In fact, when I think of cure as, I treat it and it's gone forever, if I define it that way, which is of course, isn't that what you would hope for when I say cure? Gone forever. There's actually very few cancers that prevent with a, present with advanced stage disease where we can do that. We can do that with Hodgkin's lymphoma, testicular cancer. We can do that with basal cell cancer of the skin, thyroid, um, basically the major cancers that we can stop. I, I'm sorry, and also childhood leukemias. Most times, so if we look at breast cancer, colon cancer, etc., we most often control them. And we've become very successful, and patients can live with these cancers for many years to come. Similarly for heart failure, chronic obstructive airways disease, kidney failure, we've really advanced and we control it for years, but we don't necessarily cure it. In fact, we've been so successful that in the United States we've actually increased life expectancy from about 60 years up to about 78 years. And you women in the audience will fare better than us gentlemen. Uh, you'll live about three or four years longer on average than we will live. We've added up to 20 to 30 years of life expectancy. Canada is very similar to us. Many other countries in the world are not doing so well. As you can see, they haven't got the advanced healthcare systems. Places like the Republic of Georgia, in the Caucasus countries, India, 
still running in the 60s. And if we actually look towards Russia today, they're actually were in the 60s and now regressing into average life expectancy in the high 50s. Uh, again, it's lifestyle issues. So we've been very successful in 20 years, in uh, just 70 years, adding up to 20 years of life expectancy. That's amazing. This is a triumph of modern medicine. I'd like you to meet, meet Kit. Kit was a very good friend of mine. She came to join us in a project to develop a curriculum to teach palliative care to all physicians in America. We were developing this curriculum at the American Medical Association in Chicago in 1998. She had been an executive director of a hospice corporation. She'd been on the board of the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization. She knew all about hospice care and she was very excited to come and work with us. Now when you start employment at a new organization, you have to go and have a physical exam and a chest x-ray and boom, there it was, a large mass in her lung on her chest x-ray. She had a workup. Nobody could find where the tumor was coming from. It appeared she only had one tumor. She went to surgery and had it resected and the pathology was adenocarcinoma and because we couldn't find where it had come from, primary unknown. With the very best of therapy in America, even though she looks terrific today, expected survival would be 6, 12, at best 18 months, even though she looks terrific. It's just like my imaginary scenario, isn't it? You're feeling well and suddenly on it comes. A few days after her surgery, she had no evidence of cancer. The surgeons as well as the pathologists said we got it all. But they'd cut her and she had a very significant scar and now she had both normal pain as well as pain from the fact that they'd cut her nerves, what we call neuropathic pain. She was actually requiring two to three hundred milligrams of morphine a day as well as some other types of analgesics to control her pain. What other issues do you think Kit now had that were bothering her right after surgery? So she's getting some opioids, some morphine, other medications. Slip and fall. Pardon me? Slip and fall. Well, she's at a bit of a risk, isn't she, if she gets a little confused. She didn't, but certainly in some of our elderly folks that might be an issue. Concern about being addicted. Worried about addiction, absolutely. Well, we know opioids are very constipating, so she's going to be constipated. And we know in women, you're at a bit more risk for being nauseated, so that's an issue for us. And we need to provide both regular laxatives to try to keep the bowel moving, as well as we need to provide some anti-nauseants in case she gets nausea. Can you imagine Kit might be anxious? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Ooh, what just happened? Can you imagine she might be asking, why me? Ooh, my goodness, yes. Can you imagine she might get depressed? Is she going to be wondering about her work? Am I going to be able to go back to work? She was hoping for a great launch of a new project. And in fact, the reality is she is married. She has adult children and, and, and four grandchildren, as you'll meet them later. Uh, but her husband actually slumps into a severe depression. Kid is the primary breadwinner in the family. She brings in the majority of the money, and working is a big issue for them. Her children, her daughter lives about 100 miles away, and the other daughter lives in India, and they live in Chicago. So she's going to start to ask, why me? Where's God? In fact, she was extremely religious, devout, practicing a very uh, traditional religious practice, and she really said, I haven't consumed alcohol, I haven't smoked, why me? Why this? And as we started to list up the issues, she's already got 15 or 20 or more issues in front of her, including she's asking, am I going to die? Who's going to care for me? And how will it happen? Because she knows all about hospice and palliative care. It becomes an issue, doesn't it? So there was Kit living her life just like you 
in fact, excited, vital, full of energy, ready to start a new job. She's living along her life and she has a very clear vision of her anticipated future. And suddenly she's knocked off the path. Life is now completely uncertain for her. And in fact, the doctor is saying, you're only going to live a few more months to a year, year and a half. How would you feel? Wow, I suspect is the answer. And of course, the doctor is going to say to you, and we'll do very well. We'll be able to treat you for 12 to 18 months, but you'll have to have lots of treatment. How do you feel? Wow, I suspect. And there's going to be a lot of issues that are going to cause suffering. What do you want us to focus on? Managing your disease? Managing and helping you with all of the issues that are getting in the way? Or both? I think it's a good question. So it's not only for Kit about the management of her cancer. And this could have been heart disease. This could have been lung disease. This could have been kidney failure. This could have been liver failure. It could have been anything. It could have been neurologically based disease. It's not only about managing the disease, but it's also about thinking about her pain, her nausea. Will she be able to function? How will she be able to take fluids and nutrition, the physical issues? It's about thinking about anxiety, her fears, her worries, her hopes, the psychological issues in front of her and support not only for Kit, but her family. Because of course Kit lives in a family, doesn't she? It's about thinking about family issues. Can I get my affairs in order? Do I have the money to be able to continue to pay for all this therapy? What about my legal issues? It's about questions about why me? Where's God? What was the meaning and purpose in my life if I was on a path to do something wonderful and suddenly I'm being challenged? What's next? What happens when I die? All sorts of questions that come up for patients and families instantly when we give them an advanced diagnosis or they learn that they have an advanced diagnosis. Practical issues like who will look after children? What about care? Do I have any dependents? So of course Kit doesn't have any more, anyone more than her husband because the children have moved away, but in a younger family there might be young children. Who will look after the children if I'm not going to be there? And of course, as Kit asks right from the beginning, what's going to happen if I actually die? Will I become more dependent? Will I be able to get out to nature? Because she actually loves nature as well, like you. Or, or will I be confined to my bed? And if I am, who will look after helping me with my bathing, feeding, toileting, transferring to a chair? How will all that happen? My husband. Oh my, I'm not sure he's going to be able to do that. My daughter lives a hundred miles away or a continent away. And finally, already Kit is facing issues of loss and the emotional responses, the grief that comes with loss as she recognizes that maybe she's not going to be able to live life the way she hopes. And as her story evolves, she's going to have more and more losses along her history. What we've learned by adapting a concept, some of you may have heard of Maslow's Hierarchy of Human Need. It's in most psychology courses, a concept that's taught about employees working for an organization. We've realized that you can actually adapt this and talk about processes for providing care. It starts off with the basic physiological processes. Do I have pain? Can I drink fluids? Can I breathe? Can I eat? Can I move? But those are very fundamental, aren't they? As we start to think about us as individuals living our lives and telling our stories, that's just the basics. Of course, that's where most of medicine and nursing is focused, isn't it? At the physiological. Can I manage your symptoms and can I prevent them or relieve them? Can I keep you up and about for as long as possible? But we're much more complex. We're worried about safety. Will I have a safe place in which to get my care and live my life? Uh, will I have shelter? Will I have a good environment? Will there be people around me? Or, or will I be abandoned? Will someone love me and look after me? Or will I be deserted? Will I feel good about myself? 
Will I feel that I'm making a contribution? And finally, will I actually be able to, as Maslow described it, self-actualized, what I'm going to say is, in the face of adversity, will I be able to do some of the things that I want to do? Will I have a sense of meaning and value? Will I be able to complete my story the way I want to complete it? Because, of course, we all have a sense of our story will have a finite point, don't we? But will your affairs be in order? Will you get to go out to nature? Or will none of that happen? Those become some of the challenges. And what we've realized is, within the context of looking after a patient like Kit, pain can impact all five levels. It can take away safety. It can take away love. People don't touch you anymore because you're in pain. People leave you and abandon you because they don't know what to say or how to deal with you. You don't feel good about yourself, and you have no capacity to do the things you'd like to be able to do. That's just pain. It's much more complex than simply saying the pain. I heard a lovely story recently of a gentleman coming into the healthcare system with pain. Some of you will know we describe it as we ask people to rate it on a 0 to 10 scale, 0 being no pain, 10 being the worst possible pain. And he came in and said his pain was 7 to 8 out of 10. Now, he'd lived a tough life. He'd lived part of it on the street. He hadn't particularly been a good person. We spent a lot of time trying to manage his pain with pain medicines. Not very successfully. We moved his pain from a 7 maybe down to a 5. But then as we got to know him, we learned that, in fact, he had a sister. But because he'd started to use drugs intravenously many years ago, she'd thrown him out. We also learned that, well, he was raised a Roman Catholic, but he hadn't gone to Mass. But as a small child, he'd always been told, if you don't go to Mass, you're going to hell. You will go to hell if you don't go to Mass. And now it was all coming back. Well, our social workers found his sister. The chaplain in the organization was able to talk with him. And it turned out, after the visit from the sister and the chaplain having a conversation and being able to reassure him that he wasn't going to hell, that he'd lived his life and now he could reconcile, that in fact, his pain dropped to zero. And he didn't need the analgesics. It really was about the fact that the symptom was really impacting all of these levels. It's a much more complex phenomenon than simply being able to say, you have pain, it must be coming from this, I'll give you analgesics and you'll get better. And it isn't it more, even more complex as we look at this. Now, it won't necessarily be my story about the second gentleman, but if we go back to Kit, Kit's been living her life in the context of being a member of a family in wellness, right over there on the left. And as she's received her diagnosis, she's transitioned into be an illness. And her family group is trying to cope with, how do I live with this new illness experience? And what's going to happen? And I will assure you, coming is Kit's death. Because she will die from her disease and the new transition. This family will be thrown into chaos. They will lose Kit as a member of their group. And as Tuckman tells us, groups need to form, and then they storm, and then they norm, and finally they perform. And of course, we know families have been performing functionally or dysfunctionally for years. When the member leaves the group, the group starts right all over again. Has to go back to step one and figure it all out. People need help with this. So what we begin to realize is that modern medicine today, because people are going to be living with illness for years, many of them, Kit's going to live with this illness for months to years, they need help during their illness with all these issues and coping as a family, and then they're going to need help in their bereavement. It's much more complex than simply treating the cancer. And it needs experts to frequently guide people through that process. And that's what palliative care is all about. So now it's six months later. You can see Kit has had some extensive therapy. She's actually had 
pretty extensive. First of all, she's uh, discovered that she's got a lymph node mass under her arm here in her axilla, and as a result, she's had some pretty extensive chemotherapy, some taxol and carboplatinum, some of the toughest chemotherapy we have to offer. She takes it all. She goes on to have full radiation therapy to her chest wall, an appropriate treatment because we, the oncologists, the cancer doctors, believe it's probably coming from a breast spot, but they can't find the tumor to give her that therapy. And over the 21 months of Kit's treatment, she has extensive different treatments, but because she has excellent palliative care mixed in at the same time, how much time do you think Kit has away from work? Tough chemotherapy, tough radiation therapy. By integrating the best of palliative care, Kit actually lost one day of work in 21 months. And remember what I said, what her expected survival might be, 6, 12, 18 months. Well, I'm telling you she's already now out of 21 months. She's living longer than anybody would have expected. Now, I will tell you that after 21 months, and you can see the effect of the steroids, she's puffy, she's actually not depressed, and she's actually working quite well. I can tell you because she was working with us, and in this period she launched the EPIC curriculum with us at the American Medical Association. It was very successful and she was very excited. But you can see the puffiness at 21 months because she's quite realistic about her goals and her expectations from treatment when the surgeon says to her, you still have the tumor mass, and the oncologists, the chemotherapist and the radiation oncologists say, and our treatments have stabilized it but not removed it, and the surgeon says, well, I could cut it out again, but I'm not going to stop the progression. She makes a choice. She's had enough of trying to treat the disease that she'd like her total focus of care to be palliative care, and she actually, at 21 months, enrolls in the Medicare hospice benefits. So now she's making a choice to focus on symptom management and focus on achieving some of her life goals for the remaining months of her life, and she can see that it's probably now shorter than before. So in fact, if we start to look at what does the modern illness experience look like? It's quite different. It's no longer the slope and the sudden death, and it's no longer the simple decline. Actually, what we begin to see is the modern illness experience is quite different. If this is the curve, and each one of the dips is a crisis for the patient, you can see, and even Kit had this experience, multiple crises needing more treatment, Sometimes, so if we think about patients with congestive heart failure, with chronic obst obstructive airways disease, these include multiple visits to the emergency room and multiple admissions to the hospital, even admissions to intensive care units or monitoring units. But look what happens. They get better and they go home. There's a small decline, but not abrupt decline until the end. And what happens there is sudden death. This is the story today of heart disease, lung disease, even some cancers. Many patients experience sudden death, and if the best of doctors would say the day prior to death, how long do I expect this patient will live, the honest answer would be, we really don't know, but we think at least a couple of months. It would be the correct answer. We've lost our ability to see the decline. And if we were using decline as the criteria to get access to the hospice benefit, my point is that model no longer works. But does this patient who has multiple crises need help? Absolutely. And I bet if you're in this situation, if the crises included shortness of breath, pain, nausea, family distress, anxiety, depression, you don't want to wait till the end of life to get access to treatments and experts who really know how to do this. You probably would like them early in your illness experience. Am I right? I suspect most of us would. We, I mean, I always ask healthcare professionals, if you had pain, how long are you prepared to wait until you get your pain assessed? So I'll ask you. If you have a severe pain experience, how long are you prepared to wait until you get your pain experience? 
assessed, zero. Well, there's an honest answer, thank you. Right now, please, yes, absolutely. There's one more paradigm which is in front of us today as we look at the big picture of healthcare. This is what I call the slow decline, the unpredictable death. It's what I call the dwindles. This goes on for months to years. Slow decline, increasing dependence. Does anybody know what the diagnosis is? Sorry? Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, dementia, and old age. Absolutely. And in fact, what we begin to realize is, again, if we look to the day prior to this patient dying, how long do we expect these patients to live? We'd say at least a couple of months. Because, in fact, even patients in long-term care facilities frequently, although they're not very functional and they're very dependent, or patients at home who are dependent, they often will live like that for a long time unless they have something changing their experience suddenly. And about 25% of patients in America now live this pathway. So, those are the stories. A story originally of sudden death, a story of living for a while with a decline, a story with multiple crises, and a story of dependence and decline. Those are the four ways that we now understand that patients experience advanced illness and live the last weeks to months to years of their lives. Back to you. If you had a chance to choose, yes, it's the price is right, there are four doors. If you could have a choice, which door would you choose? Who would like, and I'm going to ask you to each put up your hand once, who would like door number one, the multiple crises, emergency room, intensive care unit admissions, and die abruptly? Who'd like door number one? Nobody? Must be somebody wants to experience acute care here in San Diego. No? Several times? No? Well, how about door number two? You know the story. Increasing dependence, weakness, fatigue, needing care, family needs to take time off of work to provide care. For many of these patients, families can't cope. Patients admitted to long-term care, lives there for weeks to months, maybe even a year or two. The Windles. Who'd like to experience door number two? Nobody? Oh my! You wouldn't like to experience long-term care in San Diego County? Must be somebody. No? Oh my. So how about door number three? Uh, we'll make it the kit story. First line therapy, second line therapy, third line therapy. We're doing well for many months. Oh my goodness, we can begin to see that you're declining. Would you like to try some experimental treatment, what we would call a phase one clinical trial? Oh my. I think you better go home and be with your family because we can see you're going to die in the next few weeks. Who'd like door number three? Nobody? Oh, well, must be somebody who'd like door number three. Well, I can tell. Maybe you're all hanging out for door number four. Who'd like door number four? Living life to the fullest. Oops, died in your sleep. Who'd like door number four? So it's virtually everybody in the room. Choose door number four. And I have to tell you, I've given this talk all over the world to healthcare workers and people like yourself all over the world, and virtually everybody chooses door number four. So what I say is, the modern management of disease gives us curve number one, number two, quite different from three and four, and those are part of our success, right? But now what we need to do is take the next wave in the face of the multiple issues that are now causing patient suffering, and they're going to live with this for years, months to years, we now need to have the next wave of medicine, which is to integrate palliative care, all of the therapies to relieve and even prevent what we can predict will happen to these patients. And maybe, in fact, we can start to make curve number one and two and even three start to look like number three or number four. And in fact, that's Kit's story. So she had 21 months of aggressive treatment with great palliative care and all the supportive factors that were appropriate, and she worked for 21 months. She lost a day of work. I can tell you, she was very functional. I worked with her. 
And in fact, she then is on a decline, so she's on curve number three, and she says, I don't want to focus on going to the hospital for more treatment. I'd like to be at home with my family. I'd like to live out the days of my life. She's had the chance to understand her illness. She's had the chance to understand what treatments were possible, and she now shifts and says, I'd like to focus on being at home and enjoying life, and I'd like to make sure that my death is safe and comfortable, that my family is well looked after, and she enrolled in the Medicare Hospice Benefit. That's the opportunity that we have here in America. And in fact, as Scott mentioned, I'm focused on trying to help integrate palliative care into many healthcare systems in different countries. That's the driver for us, to make people comfortable. So as, as I ask patients, what do you want? Most people say to me, I want to live life to the fullest. Please fix my disease the best you can. Integrate palliative care, the prevention and the relief of suffering. But it's not either or. And it does shift over time. I mean, when you think about your goals of life, do your goals of life shift over time? One day you want to do this, another way you want to do that, right? And we adapt, don't we, to changes in our bodies. We adapt to changes in our capacities. And that's the reality. And we start to see the kit type of story in most patients. When we've been out in the United States and asked families, what do you believe? 90% believe it's a family responsibility to provide care for a loved one. We discover that 90% of patients would like to die at home. But that becomes more challenging in America, where just like Kit, our families have moved away, and it may not be as easy as it seems. So, think about yourself. Another question for you, where would you like to receive your care? Your illness is evolving, you're becoming increasingly more dependent, and you're going to need more care, and you're close to the end of your life. How many of you would like to spend the last days to weeks of your life in an acute care facility in San Diego County? Must be somebody. Nobody? How many of you, then, would like to receive care in a long-term care facility in San Diego County? or wherever your home happens to be. Nobody. How about at home? Aha. Not everybody put up their hand. How about you? Not at home? Yes, at home. How about you? At home? Or not sure? Not sure. Not sure. So let's ask one more question. If you're going to be, and I'd like you to be honest, and if your answer is yes, I'd still like to be at home, I'd like you to tell me. Even if you're a burden to your family, would you like to still be at home? And I'll tell you my hands up. Anybody else with me? Liking to be at home even if you're a burden? Yeah, so half the room. Well, those are some of the challenges, aren't they? And as we start to ask people what would you hope for, part of what we recognize is your choices may change and you're honest and saying, I'm not sure. You're thinking about many different things, right? Will this be a burden? How will this be for me? What are the costs, etc.? When we actually look at how dying occurs in North America, it actually hasn't changed for years. Only a quarter of us are dying at home. Three quarters of us die in institutions. And the data has not changed since 1997, particularly. And California is just about the same as everybody else. Of the people who die in institutions, two-thirds of us will die in acute care facilities, hospitals, one-third of us will die in nursing homes, the long-term care facilities. And in fact, what we're seeing is, of the people dying in hospitals, even though we could predict that they could die during this admission, half of them spend time in an intensive care unit. This is pretty wild, I think. Are we really getting the choices that you and I want? Are our doctors aware of what our choices are? So do you all have advanced directives? Have you signed a living will? Have you chosen someone to be your decision maker? Will we know or not? These are important questions. Do you really want to end up in an intensive care unit? Or what are your choices? I think these are important questions. And they become part of palliative care to ask those questions and to set goals of care that are what you hope for, as well as realistic in terms of possible therapy. 
Because there is Kit off her illness, uh, off her normal path of life, and she's actually coming to the healthcare system saying, help me. Brody, a psychologist, wrote about the story of life and healthcare, and he said, basically, in the face of an illness, our stories get broken, and we come to the doctor asking us to fix our stories. Now, fix the story doesn't just mean cure. It means allow me to live. I want to be in nature. I want to complete my business. I want to answer my questions, doesn't it? Because we're much more complex than simply management of the disease. So what is palliative care? I'd like to offer the very simple definition is it's therapies to prevent or relieve suffering. Our goal is to help people achieve their full potential, particularly in the face of adversity. But they don't have to be dying to receive palliative care. And they don't have to enroll in the Medicare hospice benefit to get it. Palliative care is provided by all healthcare professionals. It's the next group of treatments that we need to be teaching in all of our curricula. And you can hear me say, and in 1999 we launched a curriculum and it's now rolling out across America to teach all the new doctors the basic skills of palliative care. And the nurses, there's a, LNEC is a companion nursing curriculum doing the same thing. And there's a social work curriculum coming. So we're teaching folks. But if you go to your doctor and your doctor says, well I don't know some of that, they say it or they just kind of imply it. It may be because they didn't get it in their schooling, because it wasn't part of our schooling prior to the mid-1990s. And if I go back to my original diagram where we said, hmm, our focus is on managing disease and then end-of-life care, today I th say it's a different model, where in fact our goal is a mix of managing disease and managing all the issues that are causing suffering. My goal being to improve your quality of life throughout your illness experience to give you capacity to live life the way you want to for as long as absolutely possible. And, and you know what happened was Kit, she had 15 or 20 issues right at the outset, right? It's way over there on the left in the diagram and in fact she's going to live for two years. And she had advanced disease when she started. There are many patients today who come to the healthcare system with a symptom, pain, breathlessness, and they live for years. So this may go on as an integrated approach for years. And we hope that your doctor and your nurse will be able to help you with this. And maybe you're going to need a social worker, a counselor, turn to your spiritual counselor. But if you're not getting the services, Maybe it's then time to ask for a palliative care consult because we're developing palliative care expertise. And today in America, we actually have a new medical subspecialty of hospice and palliative care. And that's all palliative care. Does that make sense? Okay. So our goals, broadly, are to improve your experience of life your experience of death when it comes, and to help your families transition through all of this, cope with the loss, and rebuild their lives in their bereavement. But if you think about it, I'm here relieving your symptoms, helping you maintain your function, making sure that you're eating well, sleeping well, minimizing your stress. If we do that early, won't I help you actually cope with your dis therapy to manage your disease? It's going to make it easier, isn't it? And in fact, the question is, not only will I improve the quality of your life, but I, will I actually help you live longer? And as I come back to Kit, when people said to me, expected survival is 6, 12, 18 months at the most, and she's already at 21 months, did we actually help her live longer? I think probably that's the case. To me, Palliative care is the new wave of medicine. It's the next major leap forward, and it's about really integrating that into what we do. So what's the rest of Kit's story? It's 21 months. She's enrolled in hospice care. This is actually her husband up on the upper right here with her. You can see she's lost a lot more weight. But he's now out of his depression. He needed both antidepressants as well as pretty intense psychosocial support uh, from a psychiatry service. But he's now well. 
He's her primary caregiver looking after her, and I will tell you, in fact, after she dies, he writes a book about her story, really created a legacy, and I'm able to use Kit's story because she created a full legacy and gave permission. She actually had her full story videoed for us. So this is Kit's wish that we tell her story. Her cancer doctor, her oncologist, continued to visit her. She was able to be at home. This is her daughter from India on the left who visited her twice. These are her grandchildren who live close by. They were able to keep stories together, surprises, and gifts. And Kit was very proactive. She said, I would like all the groups in my life to come together once more before I die. We're going to have a party with every one of them. And she did indeed. Her family hosted a dinner for each group. So the team working on the curriculum came over one evening, and we had dinner with her. And she had a very tiny but very special gift for each one of us. She had some special words for every one of us. And she said goodbye to all of us. And we all knew we would never see her again. Kit died quietly in her home 24 months after her diagnosis, surrounded by her family, having completely been in control of what she wanted throughout and actually achieved amazing things on all levels. She really managed the whole process. So what do you think? Who here likes to plan? Who's a planner? Do you like, do you like to plan your life? Do you like to take decisions about your life? More importantly, who here likes control? Like control of my life? Yeah, control of your life. Who likes control? Sure, don't we all? Especially anybody who's in healthcare, by goodness, we're really control freaks. So the question becomes, what do you want your experience to look like? We are the boomers. We are the generation that's managed birthing. We are the generation that's really changed the modern illness experience. Are we now going to grapple with and really grab hold of our illness experience? In, in a very different way in order to have the opportunity to live life to the fullest? Or are we going to live with all these symptoms and in fact become dependent? I think it's the challenge. Our science isn't perfect, but we're expanding the science of palliative medicine every day. Ultimately, it's about your family, maybe your loved parents. It's about your loved spouse. For some of us, it might be about a child who's going to die before us. But ultimately, it's about you and it's about me. Because we're all going to have this experience. To me, you and I become the advocates for change in our society. You and I become the people requesting this kind of care. Do you want to have people with you, at your bedside, accompanying you? What about stories? and the ability to create, finish your business, but also create a legacy so these children will remember you. You can see the woman on the left, the steroids affecting her. She will actually die in the next few weeks. Will they remember her? Will somebody help you take videos, write it down, take photographs, give a gift, so maybe at their graduation or when they're 21, they'll have something special from you? It all needs to be facilitated. It doesn't happen magically. Will there be hugs? Or will be pe people be worried that you have so much pain they won't want to touch you? Will there be special hurrahs, a special event? She said, I'd like to take you on a vacation. I'd like to create a special memory together. Will you know soon enough and will you do it early enough and maybe you can have a second special event? But they had a lovely week together. He'll never forget it. Because, of course, this whole experience isn't just about her, it's about him and all his memories. She, the woman on the right, and the gentleman were fiancés. He wanted to finish his life knowing they had been married. This is actually the reflection room or the chapel at San Diego Hospice. The marriage took place four days before he died. And he died peacefully and quietly, knowing that they were a couple. Will all the family be there? 
will they be integrated? So as I talk about treatments, I, we believe very strongly that all the integrative therapies, art therapy, music, pet therapy, aromatherapy, touch, massage, acupuncture, are all a part of this. It's all about the whole person and the kinds of care we can offer. And for some people they help and don't, but will this family member be right in the middle of it, often creating magic? Will there be honest conversation and someone there for a final kiss to say goodbye? How will you orchestrate this for yourself? That is the challenge and I think it's the opportunity. It's truly the goal of palliative care. Because the bottom line is, the way we create a healthcare system, the people we teach and train, one day they're all going to look after us when it's our turn to receive care. If your story came today, and for each one of us our story is coming, the question is, would you get the care that you want or what do we as a society need to do to ensure and make changes to be certain that we will get the kind of care we want? We are the advocates for change. So I'd like to finish by simply saying, in the face of the challenges and the real opportunities, I hope we can all work together. This is the new wave of modern medicine, and I'd like to inspire you and hope very much that you will find meaning, value, and quality in every day of your life for as long as you live, until you die, even on the day you die. But more importantly, that together we will inspire and empower it in others. That's the challenge in front of us, where the goal is living life to the fullest every day of life. Thanks very much, and I look forward to conversation and dialogue.